Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Angela Saini. I'm an author and a science journalist, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to this week's RSA um, Thursday lunchtime event in this absolutely beautiful room. I'm just, I don't know how you'll be looking at us when you've got these beautiful pictures up here. Um, we're filming and live streaming today's discussion, so welcome to those of us uh, joining us online. Um, a reminder that the hashtag is um, RSA bias, one word. If you'd like to get uh, involved in the conversation on Twitter or on Facebook, then please do. Um, I'm delighted to be joined today by Dr. Jennifer Eberhardt to share her groundbreaking work on the psychology of racial bias and inequality. Jennifer is a professor of psychology at Stanford University, where she co-founded and now co-directs a center that brings together researchers and practitioners to address significant social problems. She's a recipient of a MacArthur Genius Grant, so she's a bona fide genius, and has just published Biased, The New Science of Race and Inequality, um, from which she'll be sharing some of her research today and also will be discussing. It is a truly fascinating book and so important. It looks at um, how unconscious racial bias, something we hear about so often, but actually I'm not sure we have such a great grip on, um, how this bias underlies the disparities we see in society, how it affects everyday life, everything from education and employment to healthcare and criminal justice, but even at a deeper level, our everyday interactions with each other, the way we... The, the things that we think when we look at other people, the interactions that we have with our children. Um, but more than that, for me, what I found truly remarkable about it, and I've read a lot on this topic over the last few years, is how measured it is. It's careful, it's compassionate, um, there's a tenderness to it, a reality, and a real willingness to move forward and think of solutions. How can we get ourselves out of this cycle of hatred which society seems to be in right now? And it's a reminder that bias is not something that just one group of people have against another group of people. It's something we all have, and to, and to some extent that we're all victims of. So Jennifer is going to start today by sharing some of her ideas from the book and reading from the book for about 20 minutes. And then we'll both be in conversation for about 15 minutes or so. And then there'll be time for questions from you uh, before we wrap up at two. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Jennifer Everhart. Thank you for that introduction and thank you all for coming. And this is a lovely uh, space. And so it's a pleasure to be here and honor uh, to stand uh, before you today. And um, I want to start uh, with a quote actually from one of my uh, favorite uh, authors, uh, James Baldwin. And he says, a journey should, uh, I'm sorry, a journey is called that because you cannot know what you will do with what you find or what you find will do to you. So uh, in this book, uh, Biased, I uh, take readers on a journey. Uh, I take them into neighborhoods and into schools and into workplaces and to police departments. And at each stop along the way, I try to light up uh, the ways in which um, bias could operate. And so I explain you know, how it affects our vision and how it affects our choices and our actions even when we're not aware of it. And I blend the science uh, with the stories of those who have been affected by it. Um, I expose uh, readers to the harms and to the, to the devastations, uh, really, uh, that bias can leave in its wake. And um, the book opens up um, with a scene of me at the Oakland Police Department. Oakland is in California, um, in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I'm um, there um, in the department to deliver an implicit bias training. And I'm <laughs> and, um, a little bit nervous about this because um, 
I, two years earlier, had been invited uh, by the city and by a federal monitor to come in to help uh, the Oakland Police Department with their reform efforts. Um, so there was a lot of scandal uh, that happened uh, there. Um, you know, in, in the years past, actually, I think at the time I uh, came in, it had been four, 14 years uh, previously, uh, previous to my um, sort of entry uh, into that space. Um, so there's some terrible things that happened that had to do with race and racial profiling and, you know, false arrests and <laughs> you name it. Uh, so uh, there was a negotiate, what they call a negotiated settlement agreement, and uh, part of that agreement was for the Oakland Police Department to begin collecting data on stops and searches by race. And so they finally done this, you know, years later, and um, they wanted to bring in what they call a subject matter expert to analyze the data and to see, you know, to what extent there were racial disparities there um, in their enforcement activities. Now, uh, I've been there and we analyzed the data. I, I work with the team of Stanford researchers uh, to do that and we were about to release a report um, to the public uh, on our findings. <laughs> and so there was, you know, pretty significant uh, racial disparities and so I was, um, you know, trying to sort of figure out um, sort of what b the best course of action was in terms of preparing the department um, for the results. And so, for example, we found that um, about 28% of the African American population in Oakland is, uh, it, uh, um, were, um, well, 28% 20, uh, of the uh, population as a whole in Oakland is African American, um, but we found that um, over 60% of the people who were stopped were African American, and we found you know similar disparities in terms of searches and terms of handcuffing and arrest and so forth, and so. Um, so I had a sense of how the department would respond you know, to this, and so I was thinking also um, that I had some sense of how the community would respond, and, and that was to um, sort of demand uh, that uh, the department take you know, some action, and that would include um, training on you know, an implicit bias. And so because I'm a researcher uh, who studies this, I thought um, one, um, you know, one, uh, uh, you know, um, suggestion might be uh, for them to get this training. And I definitely did not want to give them this training <laughs> after the report was released because I figured, um, you know, I'd already lost them at that point and they wouldn't be there and present and listening and so forth. So I decided I wanted to do the training um, beforehand. And so I go in and I'm sort of trying to train uh, the whole department within a couple weeks uh, period before the report's release. And uh, so I have my first session, and I have 132, um, you know, uniformed officers sitting there in the auditorium, sort of waiting for me to take the stage. And um, they were in full gear, right? So they had on uh, bulletproof vests, and they had uh, taut faces, and sort of their uh, eyes were distant. And I, uh, I knew I had a problem, right, on my hands, and it just, um, I could feel a chill in the room. So I started in and started sort of talking, you know, with the slides, and I would talk about bias, and I was, um, you know, sort of trying to connect with them. But whatever I did, I just couldn't make a connection. And I, you know, tried jokes that didn't work, and uh, demonstrations that didn't work, and I uh, tried showing videos uh, that, um, you know, really sort of got people engaged in other settings. Nothing, and so I decided to stop and just to tell a story. And uh, the story I, I told was about my son, who um, was five years old at the time, and we were on an airplane together, and right, so he's five, and he's just excited about being on a plane with mommy, and he's looking all around, and he um, sees a, uh, a man on the plane, and he says, hey, that guy looks like daddy. And so I look at the guy, and he doesn't look anything at all like daddy. I mean, nothing, you know. And I'm like, what is he talking about? So then I start looking around on the plane, and I notice he was the only black man on the plane. And I thought, okay, you know, I'm going to have to have a talk with my five-year-old about how not all black people look alike, right? <laughs> so I'm like, all right. You know, so I'm trying to think, 
you know, how am I going to have this conversation in language that a five-year-old can understand? But before I launched into, into the lecture, I paused and I thought, you know, children see the world differently from adults, and they see people in a way that's different. Um, you know, they haven't been trained across years to kind of see people in certain ways, and so maybe there was some resemblance there that I just wasn't seeing, right? So um, I decide I'm going to give it a shot. I'm going to look at this guy and look for any resemblance, and so um, I look at him, I look at his height, and he's about four inches shorter than my husband, nothing there. And so I look at his weight, nothing there. I look at his um, facial features, nothing. I look at his uh, skin color, you know, nothing there. And then I look at his hair, and he has um, these long dreadlocks flowing down his back. And my husband's bald. <laughs> and I thought, all right, okay, you're going to get the talk, right? So, <laughs> so I'm all ready to give him the talk. And before I could say anything, he looks up and he says, I hope he doesn't rob the plane. And I said, what? What did you say? And he said it again. He says, well, I, I hope he doesn't rob the plane. And I said, you know daddy wouldn't rob a plane. And he says, yeah, yeah, I know. And I said, well, why would you say that? And he looked at me with this really sad face, and he said, I don't know why I said that. I don't know why I was thinking that. So, you know, I thought to myself, you know, wow, we're living with such severe racial stratification that even a five-year-old can tell us what's supposed to happen next. You know, right? even with no malice, no evildoer, right? We, we see this connection, you know, that my son was making between race and crime. Um, so I stood there in this auditorium in the Oakland Police Department, and I, I uh, told that story and, you know, hoping again for a, a connection. And I want to just read um, just a little bit from the book of, of what happened when I looked out at the crowd. I took a deep breath, and when I looked back out at the crowd in the auditorium, I saw that the expressions had changed. Their eyes had softened. They were no longer uniformed police officers, and I was no longer a university researcher. We were parents unable to protect our children from a world that is often bewildering and frightening, a world that influences them so profoundly, so insidiously, and so unconsciously that they and we don't know why we think the way we do. In my own research, I found that simply exposing people to black faces can facilitate their detection of crime objects. Prompting people to think of violent crime can lead their eyes to focus in on black faces. Prompting police officers to think of shooting or arresting or capturing or apprehending leads them to move their eyes from a white face and onto a black face. And although looking black is not a crime, jurors in the US are more likely to deliver a death sentence to uh, 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 black felons who are judged to have more stereotypically black features, at least when their victims are white. So the book Biased takes a deep dive on these racial issues, especially the black-white dynamic, yet I connect that dynamic to broader issues of bias and, and based on all types of characterizations and, and social group memberships, including gender and religion and immigration status and even homelessness. So I describe um, the, um, the science uh, of bias um, in, in lots of ways and using um, science and um, using stories. And so I want to read you um, a story uh, from the book, and this will be my last reading before I sit down here. This was a little longer than the other one. Okay, my husband, well, let me just tell you what this uh, story is about a bit too. Um, so this is about a family vacation that I took uh, with my husband and my three boys. And um, 
our sons were um, teenagers, but they weren't uh, driving yet. Um, and so they hadn't been uh, behind the wheel of a car. And at the broadest level, this uh, story is really about the power of culture and custom to uh, shape who we are. So it goes like this. My husband, Rick, is the adventurous type. So when he decided he wanted to drive us through the noisy, congested city streets of Montego Bay and along winding country roads to uh, leading who knows where, I got a little worried. In Jamaica, they drive on the opposite side of the road, British style. <laughs> and with the steering wheel on uh, what Americans would consider the passenger side. My husband had been driving on the right side of the road for nearly 35 years. The scientist in me wondered if that long indoctrination had left its mark on the neural pathways of his brain. The mother in me just hoped our family would make it to our destination unscathed. We are American, I reminded Rick as we picked up the car and settled into our unfamiliar spots. Everything around us seemed to be on the wrong side, including the street lights and signs. The boys got a kick out of seeing their dad maneuvering the steering wheel from the opposite side of the car. I sat in the front next to him, determined to be the sentry who would ensure that we stayed, stayed safe on unfamiliar roads in this unorthodox arrangement. Right away, I could tell we were going to have problems. From my perch on the left side, where the driver should be, it took some time to shake the feeling that I was the, actual, I was the one actually driving. I had to try hard to keep my arms from moving up to grab a steering wheel that was not there. I found my right foot pressing down to slow the car as we closed in on the traffic ahead. The first time I saw a car heading toward us from the opposite direction, I was ambushed by panic. Stay left, stay left, I warned. Yet even as I yelled out the correct advice, something inside me kept signaling that we should stay to the right. That mental tug of war set my heart to racing. We are headed for disaster, I thought, as yet another car zipped past us on what felt like the wrong side of the street. I knew in my mind where we were supposed to be, but my body was feeling something else. Everything inside me was spontaneously firing, signaling, this is wrong. You are in, are in, you are in danger. Get over to the right. By the time we made it to the center of town, rush hour was upon us. I don't like being in rush hour traffic in California, let alone in a foreign country on the wrong side of the road. But I needed to stay calm as we navigated avenues crowded with cars, bikes, motorcycles, and people standing in the middle of the street peddling their wares. We finally made it to a long stretch of highway that headed toward the countryside. We relaxed enough to, uh, to enjoy the scenic vistas we passed and even made uh, time for a brief stop at a local tourist spot. It wasn't until we headed back to town that our driver's mental gymnastics faltered. As Rick began to merge on the highway, the boys began screaming in the back seat. I turned my head to see what was wrong, and I got the scare of my life. Two giant 18-wheelers were speeding straight toward us, barreling down the highway side by side at breakneck speed. But Rick had not noticed them because he was looking the other way in the direction the traffic would have been approaching if he was merging onto a road in California. I joined in on the yelling, but Rick was focused on the task at hand, steadily creeping onto the highway, into the path of the trucks, still looking the other way, not comprehending what all our fuss was about. The truck drivers never slowed, presuming we would stop. Who wouldn't stop? In a fury, I yelled as loud as I could, stop, 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 stop the car right now. The panic in my voice led my husband to slam on the brakes, and we all watched as the truck sped past, just inches away from the front of our car. I was sweating profusely, my heart was pounding hard, and we sat 
for a long few moments in stunned silence. A lifetime of driving on the right side of the road in the United States had shaped my husband and me more than we realized. It shaped not only how we situated our vehicle on the road, but also where we were inclined to look and how and when we turned our heads and what captured our attention. It shaped a cascade of reflexive choices that every driver makes. There was a complex coordinated system within us operating beneath our awareness and difficult to override. A whole host of actions are required to support the act of driving, but we have become oblivious to them after decades behind the wheel. We operated on instinct, though it was wholly learned. I'd gotten in the car that day expecting to provide an extra set of eyes that could help protect our sons. Yet it was precisely because our sons had no driving experience that they could see the trucks that Rick and I had missed. They had not been conditioned to look only in certain ways or expect to see certain things. In many ways, this is how bias operates. It conditions how we look at the world and the people within it despite our conscious motivations and desires, and even when such conditioning can place us in harm's way. Just as drivers are conditioned by how the roads are constructed in their native land, so too are we conditioned by racial narratives that narrow our vision and bias how we see the people around us. So I describe the science and I highlight uh, that science through um, the stories of those who are grappling with bias. And, and those stories speak to the urgency of the issue, um, yet they also reveal that bias is something that we can address. Um, so in bias, for example, I describe how uh, the tech company next door uh, discovered that they had an issue with racial profiling on their platform. How many people are familiar with next door here? Raise your hand if you are. Okay, so not that many people. It's um, pretty popular um, in, in the US and the uh, platform was designed to uh, help to create this sense of community. And so, you know, as we're moving, you know, around and, um, you know, we um, kind of go into our homes and we're not like out in the community in the same way that we used to be. And so um, the developers of this platform, they were trying to solve that problem and they wanted um, communities to have neighbors again and neighbors who spoke to one another and neighbors who could share information and, and, and uh, so forth. And so, um, so there's this uh, platform that, you know, 95% of the communities now in the U.S. are, are using. And it's actually, I, I believe it's here now in England, and I know it's in France, um, and uh, I think it's in Germany as well. So it's coming um, here uh, to, to, to Europe. And um, so, you know, they discovered that they had this issue of, of profiling um, on the platform. So somebody would sort of look out their window and they would see a black man, usually it was a black man um, in a white neighborhood, and they would uh, take to their computer and they uh, would uh, say, oh, you know, there's a suspicious person, you know, out here. And they would alert all the neighbors and sometimes they would alert the, the police to come. They would dial 911 to, you know, for pe police to come over and take a look. And um, they were using race, you know, as a proxy, really, for suspicion. And so that's when Sarah Leary, who's the co-founder of Nextdoor, she contacted me because she knew I was a researcher who studied um, issues of racial bias, and she was trying to figure out what to do, uh, how to solve this problem. And she uh, met with me and others, and she consulted the um, literature on racial bias. And she discovered um, that you know, one of the ways that you can put the brakes on bias is to slow down. Um, so a lot of, um, you know, we're more vulnerable to bias um, when we're thinking fast and um, we have to make a decision quickly. And when we're in that state, we rely on these automatic associations that we've built up over time. We, we go on automatic pilot and we just start to act and um, uh, we're vulnerable at that point to having bias infect our decision making. So she learned this um, and so she um, realized that they were going to have to slow people down. 
Now that created a dilemma for them uh, because um, they're all about speeding people up. It's a tech company, right? So they're interested, right, in things moving fast. And so their whole purpose is to create these products that don't have any friction at all, what they call friction. And so you want a frictionless product where people can use it effortlessly and easily and quickly and without thinking at all, right? Um, and these are the very conditions under which bias is most likely to come alive. It's most likely to get triggered um, and um, start to influence how we behave. So they had to make a decision about what to do. And ultimately, they decided that the um, issue was so important to them that they were going to slow people down and risk the possibility that some people would drop off of the platform. They were stopped using the platform. And so how they uh, slowed people down was to create um, a checklist, basically. So when people went to report suspicious activity, they used this crime and safety tab. And then they could you know, reach you know, the whole neighborhood at once and spread the word. And so what they did is they uh, forced people to slow down by having them go through a checklist before they posted the message. And the checklist, at the top of the checklist, was um, to focus on behavior. What was it about? the person's behavior that made uh, this person seem suspicious, right? Uh, because before, it was that he was a black man. So it can't be a social category. It can't be a racial reason. It has to be a behavior um, that is suspicious. So then second, they had to say, uh, to describe the person in enough detail that you don't um, you know, put everybody under the same broad category, which again, tended to be in the United States, black male. Um, and then the third uh, thing they did was to describe what racial profiling meant. So they get, gave a definition of profiling. And then they told um, um, all the users that this uh, profiling was um, prohibited on the website. So they set the terms of use and they, they determined what the social norms would be um, on, on the um, platform. And they found um, by um, taking these steps um, that they were able to reduce uh, racial profiling on that platform by over 75%. Okay, so this is an example of um, how even though um, we're all vulnerable you know, to bias and acting on, this, on bias, that we don't act on bias always. Um, there are certain situations that trigger it. And understanding what those situations are can actually give us a lot of power um, over, over that bias. And so um, lastly, I just want to say in, in writing about the, uh, the science and telling these stories um, and in lifting up some of the solutions, um, you know, I feel like, um, you, know, you know, the book changed me, <laughs> I have to say. Um, I had planned to take uh, the readers on a journey, but I felt myself, I, I went on a journey um, in writing this book. And my, my hope is that... Um, you know, by reading, you know, the, the pages that it can begin to change uh, conversations about race um, and inequality um, in um, the UK and in the US and elsewhere. So I'll sit down now. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thanks. It's so difficult when you have a book that's full of so many examples to just pick out a couple to illustrate your point because you kind of have to read it in its entirety to get the message. I mean, for me, um, as a science journalist, what I found really fascinating was the interweaving of scientific examples, so examples from psychology, studies that you have done and others have done, um, with the very personal. And particularly what resonated with me was um, how often you looked at, and you've given us one example of already, of having to explain to a child, a yes. young child, um, how bias works, right. and also interpret, when you see it in them, mm -hmm. how to explain it to them that they are being biased themselves, how to explain <coughs> racism to a young child, not just in your own family, but right. you, could, you have examples from others. Um, and certainly for me, I have a five-year-old, and I've had to encounter this with him wow. on race and on gender. Right. You know, and I, I'm sure many parents feel this way. It's a difficult thing. As a psychologist, then, and someone writing on this issue, how important has that childhood perspective been on your work? 
I think really important, and when I go out and I talk about the book and I you know, talk about the research, that's what people want to hear about. And I think um, you know, people um, sort of don't want to sort of replicate you know, the, the problems that we are having in the world as adults um, you know, with, with our children. And they uh, want to um, you know, raise um, children that are freer from these issues than we are. And so there's a, there's a lot of concern about that. I was um, in Chicago uh, just a couple weeks ago and, uh, at a bookstore giving a talk. And um, you know, I met a young woman there who had just had a baby. And her baby was just um, a couple months old. And she you know, just was in this uh, state where she wanted to you know, protect this, you know, her child. And she's asking me, well, you know, what, what, you know, what should I what should I do? Um, and so I, I get that quite a bit. Even also, um, you know, for, you know, parents who are trying to protect, you know, older children, teenagers, for example. Um, when I talk in the United States, um, you know, there have been uh, a number of, uh, you know, officer-involved shootings. Uh, they call them of, of, of black uh, men. And so I would have black mothers uh, come up uh, to me expressing, you know, the, the same uh, concern about sort of being sort of a target of, of bias or being worried about um, the safety of, of their child and, and what should we do uh, is, is always uh, the question. Uh, but I mean, one thing we should do, I, I feel like, is to have the conversation. I think sometimes there's an impulse not to talk about um, these things at all because we want to protect the innocence of our children and uh, we don't want to burden them with this, right? And we feel like if we talk to them, it's going to, I don't know, almost like um, it sort of distort, you know, the way that they're uh, seeing things and take away their innocence. Almost. Yes, yeah. yeah, for sure. Um, but um, I don't know. I, I think we should consider fighting that impulse because uh, when you look at the the literature, when you look at the research on this colorblind approach, it's not all <laughs> rosy, <laughs> you know, like we think. Um, yeah. You know, it's uh, you know, for example, uh, there's some research um, that has been done with elementary school children, fourth and fifth graders in the US, and uh, they were interested in um, giving them a colorblind approach you know, to um, uh, you know, racial equality um, or uh, an approach where they were taught to value difference and value diversity. And they found um, that it made a huge difference um, you know, for, you know, for children who were um, encouraged to be colorblind they also could not see discrimination. And so when um, they were told about a, a, a case of blatant discrimination and they just asked these children, these fourth and fifth graders, do you think this is discrimination? You know, only half of the, um, you know, the students who had um, been told about the colorblind approach as the way to go actually reported that as discrimination, where as, you know, the, the children who were in this um, sort of valuing diversity uh, condition of the study, you know, over 80% of them could recognize that um, as discrimination. It's difficult, so, though, because, I mean, I imagine, I, I know with my son, um, we haven't yet told him about the distinctions that society sees or what race society considers him yeah. or how important that is to his life. Right. Um, but for the reasons that you say, maybe we should be teaching him about these things. And But to some extent, I don't want to take that away. I don't want right. him to then go into his classroom and start noticing these things. I don't right. want him to have to notice these things in society. How do you navigate that? Right, it's hard. I mean, so there's the... Not noticing the things, but then I don't know. Just like we sort of rob them of of their power uh, to protect their innocence, you know, yes. in a way, mm -hmm. because you're not noticing these things, but then things could be happening, right? That yes. um, actually um, could, um, you know, have you know a negative impact on, on him and mm -hmm. on his classmates. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I talk about. Um, Elementary school, do you call it elementary school here? It's the primary school. Primary school, sorry. <laughs> I talk about primary school um, in, the, in the book, and um, you know, there's a lot there already. You know, you know children are, um, can, at least in the US, are being treated differently um, you know, as a function of race. I mean, they're being disciplined uh, in, in, in different ways uh, because of their race. Where in, in the US, you know, African Americans are. Um, getting uh, much uh, uh, more severe uh, discipline from teachers uh, for, the, for the same uh, infractions. And, and even, 
you know, I, I had mentioned uh, doing studies, uh, say, where uh, people have learned to associate um, black male faces with uh, guns and knives and, and so forth. They found uh, that people even associate five-year-old faces, black, black boys' faces, uh, mm -hmm. with guns and knives. And so, mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, so there's the mm -hmm. protecting the innocence, but then there's also, um, you know, I think um, sort of helping uh, people to, uh, or children to understand, uh, you know, what's happening so yes. that, um, you know, they can uh, play a role in um, kind of- uh, an honesty about- Yes. This is what society is like, and yeah. you know, whether we like it or not, it's going to be that way. Yeah, just I mean, like we teach them to look both <laughs> ways when they cross the yeah. street. I mean, there's a, yeah. So how do we then deal with that? I mean, a lot of your book looks at solutions. How mm. do we, then in a system, especially in the US, which is so systemically yeah. biased, there yeah. is so much discrimination at every single level, what are the steps that we can take then to start dismantling that and live in a world in which we don't think about these things and where we don't need to? Yeah, that is, that's a big question, right? Um, so <laughs> I think we t need to take all the steps that we can and at multiple levels. and so. Um, you know, we can take steps as individuals, uh, right, and um, slowing down and, and the, all the things that um, you, you know, sort of want to avoid um, that, mm -hmm. that you know will trigger bias. And so, so that can give you mm -hmm. some control over your own life. But I think we also um, want um, our institutions to be responsible um, for uh, protecting us uh, from bias and um, our, you know, our police departments um, and our workplaces. Um, I think uh, there's a lot of hope, you know, at the level of the organization of um, you know, helping in this regard because, you know, they set the tone, they set the um, social environment, they kind of mm -hmm. set the conditions uh, that can either encourage bias or discourage bias. And so that's, mm -hmm. that's a place to look. So like I said, next door, is in 95% of the neighborhoods in, in the US. And so when they decide to take a step on this in, and they decide to add you know, that uh, little checklist, mm -hmm. seems like a small thing, right, to slow people down. You know, that actually has enormous impact. I mean, mm -hmm. it has impact on them you know, as users of the platform. And it mm -hmm. also has an impact on you know, the black men who were in those mm -hmm. neighborhoods who were deemed suspicious simply mm -hmm. because of their race. I mean, your work in particular, um, a lot of it involves going out and working with police forces, um, giving implicit bias training to the police, which from this side of the pond at least, in America just seems terrible. I mm -hmm. mean, there, there isn't a month that goes by that you don't hear some kind of shocking story yeah. about um, uh, a black American being really terribly treated by the police. And in right. fact, you yourself had this experience when you were... Yep, U university. Is that right? I did. And in my twenties, actually, was the year, um, the year, <laughs> the the day, <laughs> the day before I graduated uh, from Harvard uh, with with a PhD in psychology. I was stopped by the police. So, and just tell yeah. us then about that experience. Well, it's it's funny. I hadn't thought about that experience uh, for a good while. It's like twenty five years ago now. And so, but when I started writing the book, mm -hmm. it, you know, suddenly it became uh, you know quite relevant. And so it ended up in the book, but. I was um, driving uh, with my uh, friend uh, in Boston and we were pulled over uh, by the police, but we didn't know why we were pulled over. And we were following all the rules of the road, which is a lot to say for driving in Boston. I have to say, I don't know if anybody's been to Boston, but <laughs> it's hard to drive there. Uh, so anyway, so uh, the, the uh, police officer approaches the car and you know he asks for license and registration and that kind of thing, which is typical. typical. But um, he just was really uh, rude. He was, you know, so like utterly disrespectful. Like I had never been treated like that uh, before. And uh, we asked, you know, what was wrong and why we were stopped. He refused to answer our questions. So we didn't even know the reason for the stop. And mm -hmm. he was kind of going back and forth, you know, between us and his uh, cruiser. And then suddenly a tow truck shows up. and he decided he was gonna to tow our car, and we were like, what's going on? Turns out that the, um, the uh, license, uh, the um, registration on the car was expired. Um, so it expired um, sort of six weeks uh, before that, but I was so busy just trying to finish my dissertation, right, <laughs> to graduate, that I hadn't um, dealt with that. And so he decided um, that he was gonna to tow the car, and, but 
I just, um, it was so upsetting, mostly the way he was treating us, yes. um, that I, he asked, he, he sort of emerged at the door and said, exit the vehicle, mm -hmm. and I decided I was not going to exit the vehicle. I said, you know, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to sit here. So I decided to sit in the car, um, and that just, um, I didn't realize you know, you know, the, this, because of that decision, there are all these things that happened that I, I, I don't know, I hadn't sort of thought through. And so he ended up calling for backup, and there was a, another cruiser that came, and then another, and then another, and then another. So it ended up being, we were surrounded by five police cruisers over expired uh, mm -hmm. tags, right? Um, and so then at that point, I got worried about getting out of the car. I mean, initially it was defiance, but then it was fear. Like, yes. I, I just didn't know what was going to happen. You know, all these cops out there poised for action. And so I just felt like it was safer uh, to stay in the car. But he um, pulled me out, and he slammed me. He body slammed me on the roof of the car. Um, not the hood, but the roof of the car. And... Um, I just, uh, I couldn't breathe, and I, um, I uh, yeah, it, 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 I couldn't speak, you know, yes. I, um, and then my body uh, slid down off the roof onto the ground and mm -hmm. was handcuffed and uh, carted off to um, a police precinct and handcuffed mm -hmm. to the wall there. And um, this part is not so funny, but it's like funny in retrospect. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> I, I had known from watching TV that you could, um, you know, you got one call to a lawyer. If you got. <laughs> so, so I decided, you know, I didn't have a lawyer, so I decided to call a dean um, uh, at Harvard to, to help us. And it was, well, this isn't funny either. It's only funny in retrospect. But, <laughs> but uh, so the dean, I had just been with her um, a few days before. She said, uh, because she... Um, I had been selected to be a marshal, a class marshal for the Harvard commencement, and so I was going to uh, lead uh, the procession um, into Harvard Yard for the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. It was like a big honor, and that meant I had to carry this uh, flag, and yes. so she, we had met um, because she was telling me what route I would take and so forth, and she says, if you run into any trouble, just give me a call. <laughs> And so I had her number, and I gave her a call, and I said, Dean Gill, I said, I remember what you said, you know. <laughs> and you were out of there in a flash. I was. <laughs> yep. They, they spoke, the, she spoke to the officers, they uncuffed us, and they allowed us to walk away, you know, immediately. You, yeah. I, I admire your ability to laugh about it, but, you know, it's just a reminder that to be black in America is to never, ever, what, however you're doing, I mean, you were about to get your PhD from yeah. Harvard, yeah. to never be free of the threat to your life, almost. You know, to never be free of this horrible, looming specter of discrimination and racism. Yeah, that, that's true. Um, I don't know. I, what, 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 let me ask you a question. What yeah. about here? Um. <laughs> you know, what's interesting is that... Um, well, I have experienced racism throughout my life because I grew up in South East London. South East London was not a great place in the 80s and 90s. Mm -hmm. But I was in Boston for a while. I was studying at MIT. Oh. And actually, in Boston was the one place where I was more conscious of my race than anywhere else. Oh, really? Than at any other time in my life. Wow. Because people kept reminding me. Some people thought I was Hispanic, so I'd get this Hispanic racism. Other people thought I was Indian and give me Indian racism. Um, and I remember once going to a huge restaurant in Harvard Yard, and I was sitting there with a friend, and we were having fun, and he said, and I was like, you know, there's no racism here in Cambridge. And he said, Angela, look around. There is not a single black person in this restaurant. And he was right. Mm. There were hundreds of people in that restaurant. There was not a single black person. Mm. And it was a reminder of just how yeah. stratified it was, which is not to say we don't have our problems here. We right. do. Right. But... Um, Certainly yeah. in the U.S., it's just so much more, you know, it's, you just feel it. It's so visible. It's there all the time. Yeah, yeah. Like. yeah. I mean, I grew up in, a, like, one of the most segregated cities in, in the country, yeah. which is saying a lot, given that yeah. the U.S. is pretty uh, segregated. Yes. So, yeah. um, and that, they, that certainly affects us. So we are going to throw open to questions now, um, and Jennifer is very kindly going to answer whatever you have. So let's start here then. If you just wait for the microphone because everything's being recorded. 
And if you could keep your questions as succinct as possible, because we don't have very long, just 15 minutes. Hi, my name's Suzanne. Thank you very much. Hi, thank um, you. I really like what you're saying, but I have a question around power. Mm -hmm. I totally understand that we could probably overcome a lot of bias, but what if we actually just don't want to because of the power implications, because we just feel we, we want to hold on to power? How, how can we deal with that in society? Right. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think yeah, you have to... Des have to you have to have a desire uh, to move in that direction. And, um, you know, in a lot of ways, uh, you, you look around, um, you know, that desire seems to be slipping away. And so that's a real problem. And, um, you know, even when we look at the research uh, on, on this, it's the, you know, social norms, you know, matter a lot uh, for, um, you know, how much we can address these issues. And if the slow social norms are, are, are sort of moving back and um, we don't value um, these egalitarian norms in the way that we used to, then, you know, th then that places us all, you know, in, in, in danger. It places us, you know, um, it, it, we're in trouble uh, because e even people who still, you know, sort of value those things, when the norms shift, you know, mm -hmm. our, ba our behavior starts to shift slightly. Um, so, so again, um, it's not just our, our own desires, our own motivations, but we're social beings, and so we're in a social environment. And if that social environment, um, you know, we're encouraged to sort of act in these ways that, um, you know, where, where we're not sort of, you know, dealing with bias, um, you know, we can, our behavior can start to shift in that direction as well, even when we don't want it to. So, so that's, a, that's, a, that's a good question. Thanks. And we've got one here. <clears throat> just taking that point and moving it on a bit, is it possible to push this? It's, I know you're very much focused on sort of black and, and white, mm -hmm. but it, you, you don't have to go far in our country yeah. to look at Protestantism and Catholicism in Northern Ireland, yeah. which is white on white, to yeah. put it bluntly. You can go to uh, Rwanda and you've got Hutus, Hutus and Tutsis. Right. And isn't there just an innate human, and it's a, it's a fallibility of humans, about the fear of losing something. You, you, you have all the toys, the white people had all the toys in America, they went and found it, right. and these other people, and now they're Mexicans as well, right. are coming to take it away from them. Right. And the truth is when you have minorities and majorities, as in Rwanda and in Northern Ireland, the Protestants had all the control and all the government posts. Mm -hmm. Isn't there just a human fallibility about power and the feeling of loss? That transcends and builds into this. It's coming yeah. back to power again. Yeah, it's back to power again. Yeah, that's a that's a great uh, question. I mean, there are a number, you know, of people who believe that that is, um, you know, part of what we're, um, you know, facing with the um, rise of like the, the alt right groups, and um, you know, it's about economic insecurity. Um, it's about. Um, Sort of the, the, the you know the, the, the fear that you're going to lose your place in the world, uh, for example. And one of the chapters of the book, I, I go to uh, Charlottesville and I talk to people there about what happened uh, there in the summer of uh, 2017 with the Unite the Right uh, rallies and so forth. And I talk to you know dozens of people uh, there, and um, you. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I mean, the, the, the chant there was, you know, you will not replace us. I mean, it was, it was well, it was Jews, well, you will not replace us. Um, and then it was uh, white lives matter. Um, mm -hmm. And so there was, um, you know, it, that kind of, you know, <laughs> you know, really it puts a fine point on, on, on what it is that you're saying. And, and so that is one of the triggers of bias, when, when people feel threatened, when they feel fearful, um, you know, um, they, yeah, th that, that bias can uh, really, you know, assert itself. Mm. So. And in some ways, then, it becomes a mobilizing force, really. And that's what nationalists exploit, that if yeah. we can use ethnicity as a kind of, or religion or whatever it is, as a kind of tool to yeah. mobilize people, then they will yeah. exploit it. You know, I'll say, t uh, too, when I uh, went to Charlottesville, um, I met... Uh, a driver, he's an Uber driver. Um, so I got off the plane and I'm trying to just get to my hotel and he um, says to me, what brings you to town today, right? And so I was there to actually like look at the whole, you know, the, the Unite the Right rallies and mm -hmm. um, to um, talk to people, right, about bias and all of this for the book. And But I got kind of nervous when he asked me. He was um, a white, uh, middle-aged uh, man and 
I like, wasn't sure, uh, and I'm in the South where this had just happened, and I wasn't sure like um, where he stood on these issues or what side he was on. And so I didn't know if I should actually say, you know, why I was there. And I decided, you know, I, I would say, hey, you know, I'm here, I'm writing a book on racial bias and I want to talk mm -hmm. to people, you know, about what happened here this summer. And it caused him to launch into this whole story about um, how he um, was raised by a black woman. Uh, she was a domestic in their home, but for him, more than a domestic, he was, she was like a second mother to him and he like he loved her more than anybody else in the world and she had just died and he was just feeling uh, sad about it and he was going on t you know telling me about her and their relationship and so forth and so that made me relax a, a bit but then the, the mood changed and he uh, paused and he says um, I have bigotry in my veins mm -hmm. and I said what <laughs> And he says, I have bigotry in my veins, and I can feel it rising up. And I said, well, when can you feel it rising up? And he said the thing, this relates to what you, you all were saying. He says, I can feel it rising up you know, when I'm outnumbered, you know, as he mm -hmm. thought about it. He said, it's when I'm outnumbered where I feel it uh, the, the strongest. And you know, if I'm around, um, you know, uh, if I'm the only white person in you know, a, a room um, that, uh, with black people, or even um, when he lived in Florida for a while, he said when he was there, um, you know, he could be the only white person um, in a room of Hispanics, and he, mm -hmm. could, he could feel it viscerally. Um, mm -hmm. And so I feel like that kind of speaks to your point about, um, I don't know, there's, like, there's a fear um, there about, um, I don't know, sort of what your place is and, and just yes. the, you know, your, the diminishment of your place. And so as um, racial demographics are, are changing um, and changing especially in the U.S. Uh, where, you know, white Americans are not going to be a majority of the country in a, a few um, short years. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of fear about that, worry about that. And there are researchers who've done studies where you just remind um, mm -hmm. you know, people of um, the changing uh, racial landscape, and they show a lot more bias, and they mm -hmm. show a lot more in-group favoritism, and they're w way more supportive of anti-immigration policies and mm -hmm. so forth. So, so that's real. So it's almost like an entitlement then that we have the right to outnumber everybody else. If that were to ever change, then we have the right then to react. Well, you're losing status. Yeah, yeah. and so I think that it's like a response, I don't know, like this visceral yeah. response to that loss of, of status. And what does that mean for me? And, and how yeah. far am I going to fall, yeah. I think? There's a question at the back there. Uh, yeah, Dave Meads, a lawyer and poet. Um, given that our world is, um, uh, and all our societies are awash with biases of all sorts, racial bias, religious bias, uh, gender and so on. Um, uh, even a five-year-old, you know, yeah. have it. Uh, would you agree with me that a way forward is for us to just assume we have bias? So if you're male, uh, you've grown up in a society of bias against women, just, just assume that you might have sexist tendencies. If you're white, just, just, just assume, don't be surprised by it, that you might have some racial mm -hmm. bias in you. And uh, that way, you're not surprised by your behavior. Yeah. You slow down. You just, just assume it's there. Right. Just accept that it's there. You slow down. You accept it. Yeah. You, you're not repulsed by it. But then you try to change it. Right. And that it should just be a common assumption among us that we do have biases, that they are reprehensible, it's not good for the good and the cohesiveness of society, right. but that we've got this curse, perhaps, or call it what you might, where it comes from, ignorance, whatever, yeah. and then just, then just try and address it and change it, but just assume it's there. Yeah, I mean, that's really the argument of your book. It is the all, argument yeah. of the book, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's yeah, it, it's there, and uh, it's there for a variety of reasons, and um, but that doesn't mean, um, you know, that we're poised to act on it always and in all situations. It's conditional and um, learning, understanding um, those conditions under which, um, you know, we're sort of uh, primed to act on it is, is, is important. Um, and, and again, that's, that's uh, how we manage the bias.
bias. So it's not about curing um, ourselves of bias uh, so much as it is managing this. It's, it's almost as though um, it's like a chronic condition, right? That um, can, it's there and it could be underneath the surface. It's not even sort of bothering us or messing with us you know, all, you know, all the time. It's just certain situations that it can flare up um, and get our attention. And so uh, we have to understand how to not put ourselves in that situation where it's gonna flare up and, and cause real damage. And how do you, in your everyday life then, how do you do that? Yeah, I mean, again, I mean, it's not one way you do it. I mean, it's lots of ways. For um, you in particular, because I know for myself, when I, I've written on gender and race, and yeah. it's made me more conscious of the biases that I have, and right. now I have to actively, you know, train my brain to work against them. Right. And what tools do you use in your everyday life to make sure that you're not biased against people? I mean... I, I guess as a scientist, the, the, the idea of reflection is a, is a, is a big one for me. Um, just being able to, um, you know, to question myself and to, um, you know, to step back and to, um, uh, you know, to, to, you know, allow, uh, you know, m myself the space to interrogate, you know, uh, my own actions and my uh, thoughts. Um, you know, I had this, this. Um, you know, uh, I can tell you a real short story is I, I used to teach at a prison at San Quentin a State Prison, which is in the Bay Area. And, um, and I know most countries don't have a death penalty, but uh, in the US we still do. And um, that was the place where all the death penalty, uh, the death, um, the, the uh, people who were on death row were kept, you know, across the whole state. And so I would walk past that building on my way to you know, teach, um, you know, inmates, and, and most of those inmates were, were, were lifers. And um, I, uh, the, the first, I remember the first day, and if I went in to teach the first class I ever taught there. You know, I was um, sitting in front of the class, and I'm kind of a little bit disoriented because you're in a prison, you don't know how things work, and you don't know what the culture is, you don't know what to expect. And um, but I would, you know, I would see a shift in movement, and I would flinch, you know, because I didn't know. Like what you know? What does that meant, and what is he doing? And then, oh, to be fair, we'd all do that. Yeah, <laughs> it was, but I'm just, I'm, but no. this is something I don't know. I was, I, I this is an example yeah. of like interrogating myself. Yeah. Um, there was so then um, an inmate uh, stood up and walked towards me, and yeah. I was like really mm -hmm. nervous, and I was like looking around for the guard. I'm like, what's going on? Yeah. And he just got up to go use the bathroom. <laughs> I thought, man, I'd seen that thousands of times before as a professor, right? Yeah. But um, in that situation, yeah. it, it just, um, it, it alarmed me. And he was a, a black man, too. And so then yeah. I, I was thinking, you know, what role did, does yeah. race play? And what role does his status as an inmate play? Yeah. And, you know, it, it, and it's not like I had all this... Um, I don't know, history or experience with being in a prison, but, but, but something in my body knew that, uh, you know, to be fearful yeah. um, from, from everything else that I knew out in the culture about yeah. who these people are and mm. why they're there and, you know, all of that. So, yeah. so that came online even though I didn't know it was there. I was there to actually teach. Yeah. So. I think we have time for one really, really quick question. I think this lady had her hand up for ages. Oh, hi, I was just thinking as we're in a room of probably sympathetic people that um, perhaps you'd come across the McKinsey study from three or four years ago where, and I'm going back to the, uh, the first question of all, um, which was about how can you encourage people to give up their privilege, yeah. which is really what we're talking about. Yeah. And um, the McKinsey study was very interesting. It was in North and South America and across some European countries, England and Spain, I think. And um, they looked at ex the executive uh, level of companies, many companies, and they looked at how diverse they were, and yeah. they measured their profitability, uh, you know, profitability versus uh, how diverse they were. And without fail, every company that was more diverse and had a more diverse boardroom and executive uh, level, managerial level, was more profitable. Every mm. single one, yeah. and diverse in every direction. Yeah. So in terms of orientation, or uh, female to male, or yeah. um, heritage. So it seems to me that maybe one of the ways going forward is to is to is to think about that. That yeah. actually, it's you're not you're not losing by sharing. Right. You're expanding. 
Right. So. Yeah, that's that's a good idea. But we, we're kind of held back by our own sort of narratives of of of, of, of people of women and of uh, people of color. Uh, about their worth and, and, and so forth. And so it's like your, your narratives are actually getting in the way of, of the thing that you say you want. In, in these companies, it would be um, you know, profit. And so, yeah, I mean, that's a good example. There's a lot of research showing that diverse groups actually you know, make better decisions, make fewer mistakes, they're more creative. Um, it, it's, it's more friction there. I mean, so there's oftentimes it's, it's more sort of, it's like difficult to, to get along. And so like, well, not, I wouldn't say that's a strong word, but it's, um, you know, there's, uh, it's, uh, it, it, everything isn't just sort of smooth and easy mm -hmm. in terms of the interpersonal dynamics. Yes. Um, well, there's but an the, assumption that it won't be. But sometimes there's some showing that, at least initially, um, it, yeah. it's, it's actually, it's actually yeah, 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 it, it is there. But, but um, in terms of the goals and in terms of the outcomes, um, you know, the, the, the findings are that they actually are, are doing uh, significantly better. So. Well, we could talk about this all day, but I'm afraid our time is up and you probably all have to go back to work. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for coming and for those excellent questions. And thank you so much, um, Dr. Eberhardt. If you're interested in this further, I can promise you that this is such a useful book. And as you were saying, we all have bias, so we all have something to learn from this, some ways that we can improve ourselves and improve the society that we look in, that we live in. Um, there are copies of the book for sale outside. If you want to talk with Dr. Eberhardt some more, then I'm sure she'll be happy to have yes, a conversation certainly. and sign some copies outside. So please do pick one up. Um, and all that remains for me to do is to thank you so uh, much you. for being here <laughs> and joining us.